Uh, we are going to get started, uh, but first, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish with One Spoon, One Home Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Nishi, and Inuit peoples, and acknowledging reminds us that our great standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendship of Indigenous people. Um, this is true of being here at Brock. I invite everyone to make it um, a daily practice of reflecting uh, about the land and the people uh, with whom um, they share the land, the land and that has been occupied by um, indigenous people and taken from them. So wherever you are located, um, in your own area of Canada or other countries, um, reflecting on this connection is important. So today, uh, the Posthumanism Research Institute, the PhD in Interstellar Humanities and the Department of Communications, Popular Culture and Film is happy to host a talk by Missy Molloy. Um, Missy who is a senior lecturer in film at the Te Aranga uh, Waka Victoria University of Wellington in Aitara, New Zealand, where she lectures on women's queer, posthuman, and activist cinemas. She is the co author of Screening the Posthuman and co editor of Refocus, the films of Susan Beer. Her publications include Indigenous Futurist and Women Centered Dystopian Film and uh, the video essay, Art Cinema's uh, Suicidal Posthuman Women, uh, and uh, as well as Indigenous Feminism Revitalizing the Long Take, Waru and the Body Remembers When the World Broke Open. So a number of recent and very intriguing publications and contributions. And today, Missy is going to um, talk to us about the Indigenous Feminist and Posthuman Law Experiments of Danny Huey, Lisa Jackson, and Ellen Maria Telfetters. Missy, thank you. Thank you. Um, so to open, I'll just uh, give you some context on how this research came uh, to happen, because it must seem a little bit strange for an American who lives in New Zealand to come here and to talk about um, First Nations filmmakers, but I I moved to New Zealand, um, which is Aotearoa is the Te Reo word. Um, I moved to Aotearoa in seven years ago, and now I'm lucky enough to be permanent resident there. I take uh, that privilege quite seriously, and in, in Aotearoa we have um, Te Tiriti Awatangi, which is the founding document of the country from 1840, and that's um, that's the the document that outlines the principles that dictate the relationship between Maori people who are indigenous to New Zealand and people who come to New Zealand. And as a film lecturer in Aotearoa, I take that treaty commitment seriously in terms of what I choose to teach and what I choose to give attention to. I came into these, I came to these filmmakers in part because I started watching a lot more indigenous films when, when I moved to New Zealand because um, Maori filmmakers are quite prominent and Maori films are quite prominent in New Zealand. And in fact, I started to become aware of my specialization, as far back as I can remember, has been women's cinema. And then I have a lot of other interests that are building on top of that. For instance, alternative activist, post-human, uh, micro-budgeted, socially, politically engaged films. I'm interested in all of these areas. But I'm especially have always been interested in usually micro budgeted or low budgeted films made by women. So as I became more acclimated and um, exposed to the Modi film history and present culture, I became more interested in the works of indigenous women from all over the world because there are quite a lot of links that connect the filmmakers from Aotearoa and the filmmakers, First Nations filmmakers from Canada. You know, Sami filmmakers from the far north of Scandinavia, um, Aboriginal filmmakers from Australia. There's a lot of links that have to do with the way these films are screened and the way they travel. Film festivals like Imaginative and Berlin, Berlinale and 
you know, Moli Land in Aotearoa. Um, and these filmmakers often know each other quite well um, because they're seeing each other at festivals, they're working together, they're doing Sundance Lab together. Um, so this film, Night Raiders, I wrote about for um, Russ's book, actually, which is post posthumanist film. Feminist posthumanism? Yeah, yeah. feminist posthumanism. And the reason why I wanted to write about that film particularly was because it was it was a kind of um, a unique Cree Modi co-production. So Taika Waititi, Chelsea Wynn Stanley, um, Dennis Goulet, these people worked together. They met in many festivals, they met at Sundance, and they decided to uh, take that um, relationship to the co-production level. So I started to become more interested in all these filmmakers and realizing that they work together. So I'm going to get into that. And that's part of what I'm using the term indigenous feminist to refer to collaboration among indigenous women filmmakers who were historically underrepresented, but who are seeing a kind of boom and opportunities and um, film production all over the world. And they're often working together and they're helping each other uh, to make their works more visible. So that's one of the ways I'm thinking about ind indigenous feminism. Now, for posthumanism, I came about thinking these works with critical posthumanism from another kind of root, which was that I was writing the book Screening the Posthuman with my colleagues Pansy Duncan and Claire Henry, and we were trying to cover a lot of terrain in seven chapters. We were trying to cover all the subgenres of film, of critical posthumanism, like animal studies, disability studies. And I, I was writing the first uh, kind of body chapter, and I was writing it on dystopian, apocalyptic, uh, post-humanist films. So that's, and there I started to do a lot of work on VR films by indigenous filmmakers, including *Bidab and First Light by Lisa, Lisa Jackson, which some of you might have seen, and this film called Collisions, which was an Australian film by Lynette Walworth. And I was, I was struck by how perfect these VR films by, that were about indigenous issues were for illuminating certain facets of critical posthumanism that I thought were a little bit misunderstood or sidelined. Because part of Pansy Duncan, Claire Henry, and my uh, goals with that book was to say, people hear the word posthumanism, and then they think of cinema, and they think of a certain type of film. They think of a certain type of film like her or... Um, you know, anything where there's like a pretty European American actress like in a, in a robotic thing, Ex Machina, that kind of thing. And I thought, there are so many films that are relevant to critical posthumanism that have nothing to do with the kind of techno-fetishistic, uber-sophisticated uh, aesthetic. And for instance, we were just talking about On Body and Soul, which was one of our key case studies. It's, you know, it's about two slaughterhouse employees in Budapest who have shared dreams in which they're dear. So it has nothing to do with that, what you might, what might first come to mind when you think of posthumanism in cinema. So what happened was eventually we found ourselves expanding our, our archive way beyond like the, the most obvious subjects or objects of posthumanist study. Because we wanted to say, our primary point was I guess to say that critical posthumanism that's really properly looking towards, um, you know, undermining certain the, uh, historical and ideological flaws in humanistic thinking and looking at the present, trying to understand how those historical flaws and errors are actually very much alive and ongoing, just like settler colonialism is, and then looking into the future and saying, is there a way that we can imagine a situation where human beings whatever that means to you, exist in a different type of dynamic with other beings around us. And I ended up coming to the conclusion that these indigenous feminist films are really incredible um, revelatory guides towards seeing those most uh, promising aspects of critical posthumanism. So there's some sort of overlap there. Is it a problem that they can't see all the slide? Uh, yeah, no, it, it is visible. Okay, cool. So I just wanted, before I start getting into the clips and the case studies, I wanted to make all of this quite clear. So the, if the question is, what do I think is the relationship between 
critical posthumanism and indigenous feminism, and sometimes this is going to bleed into indigenous futurism in the examples I'm going to use. Um, my first claim is the one I've already made, which is that there's overlaps that exist between the two, and I'm going to try to demonstrate that to you. Um, but I want to make this clear. Indigenous filmmakers and scholars haven't been attracted in droves to critical posthumanism. I just think that's important to make. So if you go, talk, if you went to a talk by Elamaya Tail Brothers about Bloodland, she probably would not say critical posthumanism. She might say something about feminism, or even indigenous feminism, maybe. She wouldn't say that. So I just wanted to make it clear that I'm not saying that that's something that's an explicit you know, promoted aspect of these films. They do use the term indigenous futurism quite a lot. Like Dennis Goulet will use that. So, and that's something that I think has a really clear link. So my intention is not to force theories that don't suit these films onto them. Like I want to make sure that that's clear. Um, I think there is value in thinking them together. I think it will make certain aspects of these films stand out and the vice versa. It will make aspects of the theory, it will bring them into relief in a like, really refreshing way. Um, but I think that the benefit of thinking the two together falls more on the side of critical posthumanism than on these indigenous feminist films. Like, I don't think they need critical posthumanism so much as I think critical posthumanism needs them. So yeah, I think that makes sense. So something else that we started the book in 2019, it didn't come out until 2023, but I think by the time we got to the end of it, when we were writing the conclusion, we really uh, fully became aware of the fact that we were most invested in ideas about critical posthumanism that were very critical of themselves. So we're very critical of their own assumptions about the historical problems they were diagnosing, really critical about their own claims they were making, and I feel like one of the blind spots of critical posthumanism has tended to be this, um, this effort to lump human as a species into a category. And I think part of why indigenous scholars and filmmakers wouldn't be as attracted to this kind of theory is because it's not necessarily humanistic ideologies, ideologies that are the fundamental problem from an indigenous perspective, it's more likely to be actual, um, locatable, identifiable colonial historical conflicts. So it's like, you can see that the indigenous feminist filmmakers are targeting same issues, like what does it mean to be human at this point in time? And we're facing all these new technological innovations, we're facing climate crisis, but, you know, migrant crises, increasingly per precarious material conditions for many people, same things that critical posthumanists are targeting. And yet, I think for an indigenous woman filmmaker, more likely they're going to specifically identify indigenous historical events and the realities of specifically indigenous women as opposed to women in general. So that's, if that makes sense. So let's start looking at some clips because I have a lot more theories and I don't want, I want to spread them out. So, as I said before, I was starting to watch a lot of dystopian, kind of apocalyptic, futuristic stuff. At the same time, I became aware of the fact that a lot of indigenous women in various cultural contexts were telling, use, utilizing horror in really interesting ways. So there was a tendency to use dystopian, sci-fi, futuristic, kind of intensified um, drama, and then sliding into horror specifically to address traumas related to some of the issues you were acknowledging in the land acknowledgement. So land confiscation, genocide, relocation, all of these kind of historical traumas. And another interesting thing was we were seeing that these emerging women filmmakers were utilizing, they were mixing media and mixing genre in really original and striking ways. Um, often, you would think some of these generic hybrids wouldn't work well, and yet they create this kind of striking impression. So we're going to start with Lisa Jackson's Savage. It's from 2009. It was commissioned by Imaginative as part of the, the first embargo project, and that was where uh, Imaginative, and I think it was Dan Scalay actually, the first person to do this, 
commissioned um, indigenous women to make shorts, and they did it in a rule-based way. So they got they got together, they gave each other rules, um, and Lisa Jackson is known mainly for multimedia, crossing into the art space, VR projects, installations, immersive documentary. These are her genres that she's known for. This was totally out of her comfort zone. Uh, it screened all over the world and was quite a success, and I think it was setting a tone for this subgenre of indigenous horror that is to come, which was very playful, experimental, but also hard hitting. So let's just take a look. You have a little blurb that the film used to promote itself there. I'm just going to show you a snippet of it. It's about eight minutes. It's available in full on Vimeo, so you can watch the whole thing. I just want us to think about how it's shifting genre. So we're going to go like this. Find the Oh, can you dim the lights? Or is it okay? The weird thing is I can't see the play button. If you double click. Ooh, well done. So, yeah, so here you can see something that came out in 2009, kind of anticipating what people are really attuned to in the present day, which is this um, just a greater frequency of work by indigenous filmmakers that experiment uh, and blend genres in striking ways to, to address specific historical um, injustices and traumas. Now, why would I call these things Indigenous feminists, that's the next question that might be worth reflecting on because indigenous feminism is its uh, indigenous feminisms is the preferred term, in fact, um, by indigenous women scholars. It's a contested field. So it's something that um, I put a couple I put a couple examples here. Luana Ross wrote a really influential chapter, I think, or no article in 2009. Um, and this was where she called it the F word. And that's where she talks about the how she started to do work that was could have been called indigenous feminist work, but wouldn't use the term. So she was starting to teach courses on native women, um, and she was starting to do 
activist community work in and outside of academia, but she wasn't using the term. And that was because there was a, a real hesitation to utilize the term feminist on the part of a lot of indigenous women. And that was the same for um, Modi women as well, who a lot of them don't actually use indigenous feminists. They use the term mana wahini, which means Modi woman power, kind of, if you translate it directly. So there's like, you can see that there was a, probably easy to imagine what the hesitation would be, is that historically speaking, feminism was uh, dominated by Euro-American white women, and the, the fear was that there would be negative pushback to utilizing the term, but also that feminists didn't concern them. In other words, it didn't, it wasn't concerned with them and they wouldn't concern themselves with it. And yet, so in Kim Anderson's multi-generational indigenous feminism from F word to what if, she goes back and cites Ross. And in both cases there, even in 2009, was talking about the fact that the term indigenous feminism was starting to be used with greater frequency by the time you get to around 2010. And there had been a couple of conferences or symposiums organized. There was a, an edited collection that came out of Canada, which was by um, Hundorf and Su Suzak. You guys might know that collection. So people started to use the term, even though there's still discomfort with it. And another reason there was discomfort, besides the fact that there was a suspicion that white feminists didn't, wasn't concerned with them, was also not wanting to air problems that were uh, internal to their community in the outside of their community. So there was, they were doing work both in and outside of academia that would be called advocating for indigenous women and also directly addressing heteropatriarchal and sexist problems in their communities, and yet they didn't want to call it that. Uh, again, you can see why that would be. So in the more recent, the chapter by Kim Anderson, she gives you a sense of what she, why she's using the term now and what she's using it for, while she's observing that the term is becoming more um, used more often. She says, I use indigenous feminisms to explore questions like, what if we didn't have to grapple with the ubiquitous everyday experiences of heteropatriarchy? And what are some of the ways indigenous folks are going about transforming our social relations for the better. For me, these films are really demonstrating that same kind of theoretical inquiry in the way that the filmmakers are experimenting with genre and also storytelling, cinematic storytelling. So I'll come back to that. Um, and she quotes, she quotes this source by Yazi and Baldi, and this is the this is a quotation I think that get, gets at where ideas about indigenous feminism begin to line up with a kind of material feminist inflected critical post-humanism. So I put this in there, and I'm sorry that the text is a little light. You can see it better there, yeah. So here you can see um, that the way that they're defining what indigenous feminism is as a radical relationality, and that they're seeing that practice as coming primarily from indigenous feminists, encompassing a vision of relationality and collective political organization that is deeply intersectional and premised on values of interdependency, reciprocity, equality, and responsibility. I mean, I think this lines up very well with some of the ideas that, for instance, Haraway has advocated for in recent years, not under the term critical posthumanism, but, you know, in the Thulucine book of tentacular thinking and such. And then people like uh, Rosie Bredotti talk about in her book, um, on post-human feminisms. So you see that they line up, and yet, again, we're not using the term there, I'm just thinking that it's very evident. So in terms of what I'm doing with these ideas, that are so, I would say these ideas orbit in proximity to each other without always explicitly articulating. I'm kind of bringing them together, but I'm also drawing on work by a couple um, scholars of indigenous Native American cinema. So especially Michelle Rahasia, who is from, she wrote a book called Reservation Realism in about 2010 that was really influential in Native American cinema studies. And she coined this concept of visual sovereignty, which a lot of people talk about now. So she has this uh, very frequently cited quote here. I suggest a reading practice for thinking about the space between resistance and compliance, where indigenous filmmakers and actors revisit 
contribute to, borrow from, critique, and reconfigure ethnographic film conventions while at the same time operating within and stretching the boundaries created by these categories. So what I am doing with her concept is I'm taking this word ethnographic and I'm replacing it with genre and generic. Because I think the works that I'm most interested in dealing with, they're reconfiguring, borrowing, repurposing genre conventions. And they're doing so to assert a certain type of narrative and visual sovereignty to take uh, take ownership of certain you know mainstream cinema practices, reinvigorate them, repurpose them, and inject them with new meanings is more or less the way I view it. Maybe I should visit this really quickly. So another thing that may be thinking about as we cycle through the clips is not only the issue of to what extent and how these films engage with specific heteropatriarchal sexist realities, indigenous issues that women face. Um, missing murdered indigenous women is one of the most obvious ones that come up quite a lot. Um, but also this question of in the actual film, like in which ways does it, if you think about what, what you would call a feminist film in its own right. I think there's certain aspects of even the short clip I showed you from Savage that are kind of um, illustrative of a feminist film practice because, for instance, when you see films in American kind of, the, the Western was the most common genre where Native Americans featured in American historical film, and yet they played certain stereotypical roles. As you move towards the present when you start, start to see revisionist westerns, you know, post-unforgiven kind of train, you see more Native American plights being featured differently, like a little bit more like acknowledging that there was a historical injustice, and yet with Native American women didn't often have speaking roles, for instance, or they just played the kind of role of the suffering Native American women. So this is work that's been done by Kelly Simmons, who wrote a book called The Savage Screen, she goes back through American history canon, talks about um, how Native American characters functioned in Westerns and horror, primarily in the American mainstream canon. But what is interesting to me is you can see the mother whose daughter has been taken by the authorities, she gets to speak, she gets to sing and emote. I mean, that's part of like the very first thing you note is this expressionistic musical mode where she gets to sing in a way that's really like expressing her pain. So she's having, having a voice there. And then, like I said before, Lisa Jackson had to do this mix. It was, it was part of her challenge in the rules-based embargo project. And yet, she had to combine heavy metal. She had to combine musical heavy metal, I think. Um, and she included the, the thriller zombie number, which this is before Boy had the thriller moment, by the way, which is a more famous film by Taika Waititi, better known. But they, you see the kind of subgenre now of like indigenous horror that has a zombie or cannibalistic. Um, it uses as an analogy for the historic the switch where colonial practices transition from being explicitly genocidal to being more re-educating and kind of indoctrinating. And the zombie motif works very well to express those ideas shorthand in a, in a genre that's very appealing to viewers. And this is kind of like what I'm seeing here. Um, but you have a lot of, you know, they have the young girls, they're in this, we can imagine, a horrific situation, and yet by injecting it with this um, musical number and the zombie subgenre, we can think about it in a slightly different way than we were just in cinematic realism, which would be purely pathos-driven. Um, like kind of the way Killers of Flower Moon demonstrates the treatment of the Osage women. So it's like, oh, that looks terrible. Here we get to, we're still thinking that, that this looks terrible, and yet we're seeing it in a different uh, register. So this is more or less the way I started to think about this very unusual genre blend. So Ellen Maya Tailfeathers is, 
kind of the unifying factor of these different works. And also it was my point of entry in. She's an unusual filmmaker. She's, um, her identity is an interesting hybrid. She's, her father is Sami uh, from Norway and her, her mother is Blackfeet from the uh, Blood Reserve in Alberta, right? I think. Uh, over in the West. <laughs> I think it's, I think it is. Sounds right. Yeah, I think so. Um, and she worked on the film I'm going to show you some clips for. It's called Beatos. It was part of the second commissioned embargo project by Imaginative. And she worked on that with Lisa Jackson and was commissioned by Dennis Goulet. So we have all three of the filmmakers I'm working with working together on that particular problem. But I'm going to show you a couple very short clips from a couple of her different works, because I think because she's experimented with a bunch of different genres, so in Beatles you see a blend of um, romance, coming of age, and very subtle horror inflections when it deals with the residential school history uh, for, for her Sami father. Bloodland has pretty pure horror beats. It's just uh, applied in a kind of unexpected way. A Red Girl's Reasoning is a rape revenge film noir, feminist avenger, like in the kind of Lisbeth Salander, Girl with Dragon Tattoo kind of way, but explicitly uh, an indigenous woman, First Nations woman, avenging crimes against indigenous women. Uh, and then The Body Murders in the World War Go that I think most people are familiar with, it was the long take social realist film. We're not really talking about that one much, I just put it up there to demonstrate that she is really comfortable moving into these different registers but she's utilizing these different generic registers, sometimes drawing a little bit, some embellishments from this genre and that, mainly, to, and mainly in a purposeful way to draw attention to these specific issues. Land confiscation and resource exploitation, sexual, sexual violence specifically against indigenous women, the traumatic legacy of residential schools, and domestic violence and poverty. So each of her films lines up with one of these emphases. She shifts the genre to best address that particular um, issue. So to me, this is one of the aspects that I'm starting to become more convinced is a staple of this type of indigenous feminist genre experimental work in that it shifts and blends to best address a particular um, issue. So let's take a look at Bloodlands. I did put the I did put the content warning at the front of this, but I should have said it. But there's a quite this there's a lot of horror moments in these films, and they they all deal with colonial and other forms of violence, sexual violence. So it's all a big content warning. So this film came out the 
same year as Savage. I would say this one is the, of the examples I'm going to show you, is the one that's most explicitly utilizing horror elements. Um, but the thing I'm more interested in, I guess, than the obvious use of certain elements of horror, and it's categorized as horror, so it's not like that slippery of a categorization, um, is the use of the woman's body to represent the, the relentless violations of uh, confiscated lands. And this lines up quite well with the indigenous feminism's um, ideas that Kim Anderson proposes. So here she's talking about, and she has, and she's endorsing a, a theory of indigenous feminisms in the plural that derives more from the practices. The theories are dependent on the practices. So she's seeing what indigenous women are doing to advocate for each other and to help to improve the material conditions of their lives. And then she's deciding what indigenous feminisms are, or might be, or could be based on that. So she talks about the missing and murdered women and girls. And here she includes this quotation. The industrial system of resource extraction in Canada is predicated on systems of power and domination. This system is based on the raping and pillaging of Mother Earth, as well as violence against women. The two are inextricably linked. Indigenous feminist approaches thus connect body, land, and gendered violence, and these positions underpin related activist work. So I'll ask you to think about that. It applies very directly and obviously to Bloodland, but it also is interesting in the way you have a history of thinking about women and associating women problematically with like the natural world, kind of like exoticizing or you know taking women out of the social order and putting them into the natural world to keep them um, in their place. Here, I think they're saying something a lot different is making that direct connection, but I think it's a literal referent here is my main thought. There's an analogy being drawn that's saying that the relentless and explicit uh, rape of indigenous women connects to the way that colonial practices in settler colonial countries continue to approach land and resource um, management or whatever exploitation, I guess you want to say. But it's a literal connection she's making. The two things are not, not uh, they're not uh, casually linked, is what I'm saying. So there has been some interesting work, actually, that tries to delve out. The statistics tend to be problematic when it comes to sexual violence overall, but especially uh, against indigenous women in, in certain contexts, but like where fracking and where industrial kind of oil production is most heavily concentrated, there tends to be higher, higher rates of uh, sexual violence against indigenous women. So it's not, it's actually literal is my point. It's not some kind of like art cinema gesture, like in Mother by Darren Aronofsky. It's like, this is a real thing here. So to me, it's a bit different. But I'd say, if you think about the fast paced montage and the short, extremely short takes, where you see the cuts, the screen, the close up on the screaming face, the kind of gore of the gouging, and then the kind of a little bit less uh, disturbing image with the cloth, the cloth over it. This would be consistent with the type of horror aesthetic that was popular in the first decade of the 21st century. Some people call this kind of stuff like a torture porn because they thought it was really about the sensationalization of suffering to appeal to like a purient viewing interest. But again, for me, this really lands differently for a number of reasons. But I think. Uh, she's making a film in a way that's legible to a certain um, taste and a kind of certain montage style in horror, and yet she's like repurposing it. So this is, uh, again, kind of my way of reading this, these experiments. And yeah, I think I planned way too much, so I'm going to have to skip some things. But this is, um, this is just a recent source by Sherry Hundorf, which is one of the women who kind of started to more bring the term indigenous feminism into more popular and academic usage. And she wrote this article recently, it seems from the fringe, gender violence and geographies of indigenous feminism. And the, the point she's making about the real realities of sexual violence um, against indigenous women today, they really line up quite well with the work that um, 
all three of these women are doing, but I guess especially um, at the moment, Elamaya tail feathers. Just trying to think, we only have time for one more example from her. We can do the rape revenge film noir. Yeah, I guess we'll do the rape revenge film noir just to show you a totally different genre that's dealing with sort of similar issues. Um, so this one was 2012, so it was a couple of years after Bloodlands. Um, and again, if you remember that time period, we were still in the we were still in the wake of the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo's global phenomenal success. And Lisbeth Salander was like a pop celebrity. There was an H&M line, I guess, for <laughs> outfits. So for me, I really see the residue of that time period when I see this because I really just imagine. Elamaya Taylor Feathers, an emerging short filmmaker, thinking, well, I want to make one of these films that are like so hot now. You see her engaging, I'm going to show you a little bit of the trailer and then a little short clip of a scene. You see her engaging with like the popular, the aesthetics popularized by like Quentin Tarantino and action films like Kill Bill and in his exploitation, black exploitation kind of ripoffs. So you see that kind of aesthetic, that style, but she's really explicitly. Um, voicing and in, you know, First Nations woman's concerns. So she's taking that really popular character and she's, uh, you know, putting it through a totally different lens. So I'm going to show you the little bit of the trailer because I want you to see how stylized it is and how much she's utilizing cinematic techniques that were really popular at this time. And then I'm going to show you a very short clip that shows you the film noir elements. Film noir is one of the most historically and most popular genres, so it's interesting to see that blend even in a 10 minute short film. So here's a bit of the trailer. also see, uh, you know, a pretty direct engagement with the whole history of rape revenge as this kind of, the way it initially came to life in B-movie B horror in the 70s and 80s, in male-directed works like Spit on Your Grave and things like that, and the way that we've gradually seen in recent years as there's been more women moving into the roles of writing and directing, you see more women moving into these highly stylized, generic films that deal with sexual violence from the perspective of women. And that would be like Girl Walks Home Alone at Night um, by the Iranian-American director, I'm forgetting her name right this moment, but Promising Young Woman was probably most successful was by a white British woman, Emerald Fennell. But you see, the, and these, this is way before these, by the way, but this kind of subgenre of films that are highly stylized that are strategically using genre to kind of revisit that sexy, kind of edgy rape revenge space, but 
from particular women's perspectives, and they're more or less successful. But you can see that this is really different than a, a feminist auteur doing a film about rape in a highly uh, realism-based way, which there have been really good films that do that. It's a very different strategy, and you engage very differently with viewers, and the effects are different. So here you can see her, uh, you know, doing that. And I'd say post-Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and pre-Promising Young Woman in that same world. So in this, I just wanted you to see this scene that it precedes the kind of gore scene and torture moment, which you know is going to come, because you expect that in the, in, I think, in the feminist Avenger space. Um, it really looks like a film noir, I, I'd say, from classical Hollywood. Um, but there's an interesting kind of interplay between the two indigenous women in the scene. So I, I think that you're probably pretty familiar with uh, debates about the, the real world um, kind of value of rape revenge stories, for instance. Um, so they've been criticized over time just for being too, too stylized, too entertaining on a certain level, and utilizing sexual violence as entertainment has obvious problematic aspects. Um, and if you think about Promising Young Woman, there was a there was a split in the way that viewers tended to perceive it. Some really celebrated it as being like really liking that reversal of power. Um, it looks like that scene pretty much. I mean, the guy could be right from that film. So you have a kind of trend there. Um, yeah, but other people think that there's real limitations to utilizing this genre, uh, especially when you end it in a way that like Promising Young Women did. Where you see that it's kind of Thelma Louise kind of the ending, but there's no way forward for the character. Um, let's go back to this slide. So we don't have time to look at all the examples. The other one is a is a collage film that deals with her own family history and her her Sami father's um, efforts as an adult to deal with traumas that bro they broke her family apart and her parents divorced. But it utilizes animation. It utilizes um, family archival footage. It does reenactment. It has moments that have kind of minor horror elements when they're trying to discuss his experiences in the residential schools in Norway. Um, it has coming of age moments, and it's about, I think it's like 13 minutes. So you really can see real kind of ballsy, generic uh, blending. And, it, and if you watch Beatos, you'll see that it's somehow managed in a really graceful way. Uh, it's a very, very good short film, so I uh, emphasize that you should take a look at that if you can. Um, so for me, that's where she begins to get into a different set of issues, and she starts to transition into different genres. Her most well-known work to date is The Body Remembers When the World Broke Open. It's very much in the, pat in the pattern of social realism, um, and it's dealing with domestic violence, against women and uh, reproductive inequalities, like the access that, and the way that women have treated indigenous women in the Canadian health system. So this slide was just meant to give you a little more information about the Embargo Collective. For me, the Embargo Collective it, it unified these three filmmakers directly, because they all worked together on the Embargo uh, Project 2, the one that came out um, in 2015. 
But I also think it draws attention to certain aspects of indigenous women uh, working together, taking different roles in each other's films, produce, executive producing and producing each other's films, but also just like an atmosphere of collaboration rather than com competition that I think is really uh, illustrative of the way these, I guess, pan-indigenous women filmmakers are working in the world today. Um, we, we screened a film that was, we screened some film the other day in Waterloo that was by indigenous feminist producers, one called Wadu, one called Vai, and we screened Kaina, which was the third. So these are films that are made collaboratively by a bunch of indigenous women, and they help each other move to, uh, move from emerging filmmaker to more mid-career filmmaking. Usually some of the successes of these anthology films have led to feature films, like in the case of El Maya Tefa, there's Beatos was her, Embargo Project film. It won a, a TIFF award, I think, or a, a Canadian Screen Award. And she went on to make a feature film, which is also award winning. So it's a way in which uh, it's a platforming device. It helps to increase visibility, and the, they grow from strength to strength, more or less. So this is part of the behind the scenes industrial aspect of indigenous feminist filmmaking. But it also helps to transition. <laughs> so um, uh, I don't really have time to show the sucker fish example either. Maybe come back to it during the um, during the question and answer if people are curious. It just was interesting to me that Elamaya Tail Feathers actually got this challenge in the embargo project. She was supposed to make something like Lisa Jackson's short film called Suckerfish, which was her first embargo project film which was another mixed media effort to grapple with her own mother's story. Her mother was a victim of the residential school system. She had a troubled relationship with her. She uses mixed media, animation, collage, voiceover, reenactment, all the kind of similar stuff that Beatos ends up using to engage with that history. And that was a departure from her practice. And just one other thing to note is that all of these all of these filmmakers have dealt in some generic text that deals with residential school history. And in the most recent example was Little Bird, a miniseries that came out last year here. It was actually created by Jennifer Podemski, the sister of Sarah Podemski, who's the lead, one of the leads in Reservation Dogs, and she was also a lead in another short film I'm going to show you. But it was co-directed by Ellen Maya Taylor, who did three episodes. Zoe Lee Hopkins did three. They were on an embargo project together. So the six episodes, three, three, and they're working with one of the Podemski sisters. The Podemski sisters are all over these films as well. And this series deals with the long-term effects of residential uh, school extraction from community. And it does so in a pretty sophisticated way. And I had a clip that was lined up where she's dealing with the effect of residential school. She's dealing with the historical trauma when the, the character was taken, but she's dealing also with the trauma of the characters present, where she had been moved to a Jewish um, Canadian culture. And she's dealing with the violence and feeling isolated in that. And then other aspects. So there's a pretty awesome kind of Godfather-esque montage there. So you can see all those genres that we looked at before, and you can see that sophisticated use of horror elements mixed with other to kind of give give a kind of more social realist heft, but also genre accessibility. So that's the first episode of that series, and it was directed by Ellen Maya Tailfeathers. And it looks like uh, I only watched the first episode, but it seems pretty. Level. And this was the social realist film, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, I'm going to skip it. So, we're moving on to the final filmmaker, and this is Dennis Goulet, and she was um, the director of Imaginative for quite a long time. Her first feature film is Night Raiders, which came out in 2000, uh, 2021, so peak pandemic release, so challenges, of course, related to that. And like I said, from the start of the talk, it was um, historically significant for being the first explicitly Cree Modi co-production. You see a lot of really influential Modi filmmakers in the list of credits, uh, and you see a lot of influential First Nations filmmakers in the credits too. So it's, a, it's an interesting effort to a big budget genre film. It, I think it was, at the time, it was the biggest budget genre film made in Canada by an indigenous filmmaker. It actually had been in Blood Quantum, 
and then first they, and then night raiders came along and took that over. And in this case, Dennis Goulet was experimenting more in the dystopian genre, but she's utilizing horror elements in futurist sci-fi dystopia. So before we watch a clip from Night Raiders, which is the more well-known work, I want to show you a short clip from Awakening, which predates it by, I don't know, eight years? So it's much earlier. It's closer to when Beatos came out. Yeah. And Bloodland. It's about just after Bloodland came out. So this is a very short film, and it's on... Um, it's on YouTube, it's on Vimeo, so you can watch the whole thing. It's only about eight minutes, I think. Uh, but it had a quite intense world building in that eight minutes. So it's a pretty high production value short film getting into familiar dystopian sci-fi elements. I don't know where my clip went, though. Oh, no. Sorry. So this film is interesting in how much it shifts because the if you look at the first couple minutes pre came before that clip, it really looks like the most popular genre of our time, which is a dystopian futuristic look. And she has a weird kind of old school looking weapon, like a Katniss in the Hunger Games, but she's walking around those hollowed out children of men esque looking places. Um, looks like the week, what's that new one? The Last of Us. It looks like the episode where they go to that quarantine camp. It looks like that. And then she goes into this other space, and then it's like this uh, amphitheater with the horror lighting, the the over bright whites, the two dark darks, and then you have that the supernatural horror kind of monster sound. So where every the voice makes everything sound way scarier. And here, when I'm thinking about this, it reminds me of, like, I think True Detective, the first season, had come out. Just, you think you know that, too? So the supernatural, suddenly sliding into a supernatural kind of gothic vibe, I think, happens there in a way that happened in the first season of uh, True Detective. This is not crime at all. This is really supernatural horror. But in, in this short film, you can see she goes from fearing this, it's a, based on a, indigenous story of a, a spirit who's become, people are frightened of, has become antagonistic. The spirit is being, is like an enemy of the authoritarian state who she's fighting against. This is a very short film, but it's complicated, it sounds. Um, she goes into that space. Obviously, she's frightened. So you get the shot, counter shot, the scared face, the real light looks like signs of the lambs in the basement or whatever. And then it changes. Authoritarian forces burst in, when they're threatening her, this old, you know, archaic spirit defends her. And then there's shot, counter shot, looking of love between them. So I'll just give you a quick look at that. So to me, there's like a weird romantic moment <laughs> between the Avenger, the feminist kind of post-human figure, and this prehistoric spirit who was powerful, had become a threat. Um, is it definitely explicitly against the authoritarian colonial state. <laughs> I make it sound too complicated. 
So I mean, that's the last shot. It's kind of an open-ended thing. So you have, a, in a very short time, you go from a kind of dystopian sci-fi anime tale kind of aesthetic to supernatural horror aesthetic, and then to this shot counter shot, medium close up, standard romance framing where they're looking at each other, and her face actually changes from fear to um, love. I think <laughs> so. It's an interesting. Open text, I would say, where you see Fanny's relate experimenting um, with futuristic genres, blending them, definitely utilizing horror, and it anticipates what she ends up doing with her first feature film, Night Raiders. Now, I don't have much time, so I'm just going to help. You guys have seen this, I'm pretty sure. So what I want to do, I'm assuming that most people are mostly for, are familiar with this film. I was, when I wrote about it in Russ's book, I talked about it as most obviously drawing on um, Children of Men um, by Alfonso Cuaron, which most of you have probably seen. And actually, Dennis Goulet was open about that, but there's certain moments in the film that are clearly referencing, for instance, the Bex Hell the Bex Hill uh, sequence that initiates the long take that's really well known in Children of Men, you see a moment in the film uh, Night Raiders that's very similar. Um, and then there's a whole, the main plot point is that her daughter, you weren't allowed to have kids in this futuristic authoritarian state. Um, they take all the kids and they put them into schools and they retrain them. And then those kids, if they're successful, they get to move into this better place, whereas the mother is left behind in this more like Bex Hill refugee kind of space where people are, you know, dying of weird diseases. They don't have sanitary conditions. Um, they're like the left, the left behind. So she joins a band called the Night Raiders. It's pan-indigenous, but it's led by Cree people, which is the, the, the filmmaker's Cree, that is the way. Um, and they get her out more or less. I'm going to show you the very final scene. Because I think it's a really good example of, the film borrows from a lot of recognized dystopian classics. It's, and it's not shy or like uh, subtle about it. So there's aspects of Hunger Games that you see, and there's aspects of um, Handmaid's Tale, like I said before. But it, it, it tells stories that are also different and kind of add layers to that. Um, what I thought was most interesting in terms of critical posthumanism was the way that she takes the, main, the secondary character, the daughter, she's shown in the beginning of the film when they're trying to survive outside the eyes of, or underneath the gaze of the authoritarian force. When they're living off the land, more or less, they show that she has a special capacity to, to communicate with animals. And she uses her a native tongue to speak with animals, so not the colonial language. Later in the film, we end up seeing that she has the same ability with tech. So to me, this is like almost like a direct uh, reference to the off-screen reality in which a lot of um, indigenous creatives are trying to move more explicitly into new and emerging media, VR, um, to tell stories that uh, maybe were older stories that were maybe like uh, specific to their culture, and also to tell stories that are familiar with mainstream culture, genres, 
uh, like dystopian sci-fi, but to inject specifically indigenous relevance to them. So here, the climactic sequence, you have the authoritarian force come to confiscate and eradicate the Night Raiders to break down this rebel group. And what it becomes clear is that they want to, they're not just going to take their land, they actually want to murder them all. And she, her post-human ability, was my argument, is the thing that kind of saves them. So you see a conversions of different um, genre here, and you also see some elements that I think are relevant to critical post-humanism. So we'll just take a look at this sequence. This might be the last one. It's interesting, though, when I was thinking about it last night when I was putting the clips together, is in the in the standard rape revenge, you get the, the feminist avenger will per, try to reverse and flip the violence against the uh, perpetrators. And here, there's an emphasis, especially on land sovereignty, the fact that land was confiscated. And here, the, the revenge sequence that's climactic is about uh, recovering and protecting the land from being confiscated. So again, you see that uh, overlap of the way the issues kind of fold into each other and resemble each other. criticism of the film that said it was too generic, too derivative of familiar dystopian sci-fi films from the past. But to me, I didn't find it at all so because I felt that they were being, that the elements that were being drawn from very purposefully were being uh, utilized to tell a different kind of story. So in this case, the thing I liked the most was in fact the way that that um, that old stereotype of, of cold, white uh, American and Canadian authored media where Native people would be endowed with a special natural ability, like Pocahontas, I mean, running through the forest, talking to the trees and stuff, and teaching the colonials how to talk to the trees. So that's a stereotype that a lot of contemporary Native artists and indigenous filmmakers are, you know, they think it's funny, they make fun of it in Reservation Dogs quite a bit, and they also... Um, you know, they want to break those stereotypes using comedy or satire. Here, I think she draws attention to it, 
but transitions it and brings it to bear on, uh, you know, so sophisticated futuristic technologies. And here I think it's like an emphasis to speak specifically to an indigenous audience about the potentials of utilizing technology to advance their causes. And here you have, you, you know, utilizing um, the indigenous language as well and then transitioning to English is also drawing attention to the history of, um, you know, language erasure. And now we have language revitalization, which is um, ongoing and it's like a hard practice. But these are ways in which you could take indigenous knowledges that are so present and funnel them through the realities of the present. So this, these efforts in indigenous futurism to tell explicitly indigenous stories in the, in the um, generic stylistic and narrative terrain of, of futurism and sci-fi, this is an effort to you know, take indigenous people and culture out of the past. So a, a colonial um, technique was to make it seem like everything relevant to indigenous cultures in the past. This is trying to say, we can actually invigorate our futures with our own knowledges and practices. So it's like drawing attention to that colonial stereotype of Pocahontas, but then recasting it. So to me, it's fairly innovative and it's not derivative in this way that would be like dismissive. So I have way too much planned, so I'm just gonna go to um, I'm just going to make a couple of points, and maybe you can look at these things on your own. Um, an interesting facet of Dana Scullet's work since Night Raiders is that she directed four episodes of Reservation Dogs. She directed two in season two and two in season three. And her episode, Dear Lady, in season three um, is one of the most like critically acclaimed and striking examples of episodes from the series, but also was sharply departing from the main generic um, tendencies of the series, which was like dramedy, I guess, like the Atlanta kind of, um, the bear kind of blend, comedy and drama together with realism, some little bits of surrealism um, coming of age was like how the series started. As it progressed, a lot more women directors began to take on writing directors uh, and directing roles. Uh, it started to change more and they got more ambitious according to the writer's room and they started to tackle some things that they wouldn't have necessarily done before they got successful. But, so this is in the last season. She does the Dear Lady episode. Uh, this is a feminist rape avenger figure, but it's, it's a version of it that goes back to different uh, indigenous stories about a woman mixed with a um, deer who you know, attacks the bad man just like the vampire and girl walks home alone at night. But in they do an origin story of Dear Lady because she had popped up throughout the series as just like an interesting enigmatic figure. This one was directed by Dennis Goulet and it actually does full on horror when it does the scenes at the residential school. So that's her origin story is that she was um, taken and put into a residential school in the world of reservation dogs. And then they use that kind of voice actually um, when they have the missionary people talking to the children, they have, it sounds like gobbledygook, but it sounds like that creature in the horror scene from Wakening. It's like, <laughs> that's my intention of it. And it's like, so to the kids, it's like this freakish monster supernatural moment. So she uses very explicitly horror techniques, and even the, epi even the episode has a rape revenge spectacular violence moment. Um, not rape revenge, more like Feminist Avenger, so not to confuse it with that. And then finally, um, like I said, to circle back to Lisa Jackson, which I started with Savage, which I thought was this, you know, really uh, influential short film in the way that it dealt with genre and how stylized it was and how much it was willing to mix genres. I just wanted to point out that her work is really versatile and it moves into Multimedia. She's not as much a classical like feature film and short filmmaker, even though she does a lot of short film work. But she's done some projects that I think are really interesting to take a look at. Beyond in First Light was her VR film. That's the first thing I ever saw of her. I saw it at Maldi Land actually in 2017, and it's it's an indigenous futuristic rendition in VR of Toronto in a in a after an apocalyptic situation. 
So all the languages that are originally spoken in Toronto, you're, you have it in headset and you can hear them all around you. Um, and it looks like downtown Toronto, but it's no people except for one indigenous woman in a tent. So it's like, it's looking at that, there's a lot of works that are anthrop anthropocentric, I guess, cinema, that like anticipate uh, reclaiming of the world by nature. And in that film, she orients it around an indigenous woman and, in, and all the languages that were originally spoken in the place. Um, this film is a super, uh, is a, it's about lichen, and it utilizes uh, really special uh, close capturing cameras to create like an otherworldly, um, an amazing kind of supernatural take on lichen. And that, this one was co-commissioned by um, the Canadian, maybe Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, maybe? Yeah, so she did this one on this uh, highway in British Columbia, where uh, an abnormally high number of, of indigenous women have disappeared and been murdered, uh, or suspected murdered. Um, and they used, they used the VR technique. You can actually watch some of it on YouTube, and you can use uh, the mouse to scroll around. They use more like a little bit of horror techniques, but more like mystery, I would say to kind of make the, the sense of place of this highway look particularly threatening. So you have like voiceover of a mother who, whose daughter disappeared and was discovered murdered a year later, and you have a dark highway at night sort of in crime register with the flashing headlights coming at you. And you can look around, and then you get the aerial views. So it's almost like that, that sense of an overwhelming natural world that's very beautiful but has all these threats for a particular type of person, a young indigenous woman in this case. And that was just to say, to kind of circle back to both these ideas of the critical facet of indigenous feminisms, which is to drawing attention to those ubiquitous um, you know, experiences that women have, indigenous women have under heteropatriarchy. So that's especially relevant to the missing and murdered indigenous women movement, but also just to the high rates of sexual violence uh, against women uh, in Canada. So that's the indigenous feminism kind of relevance, but also to the, in the, that's the critical dimension of it. But I think in like, in the more optimistic forward looking dimension of these works that experiment with genre to draw attention um, to, to kind of actually energize indigenous feminist ideas. They're anticipating this idea of radical relationality. As they say, to be good relative is to be an indigenous feminism. So this is the idea that, in fact, indigenous feminism is about, um, it's not political in the same way that, you know, white or uh, Euro-American feminism is. It's political in a different way, and it's about kind of Promoting idea of promoting ideas of women collaborating to tell the stories that are specific uh, and most relevant to their experiences. I think I have to stop there because like that was very long. My phone is lighting me up. Hope it makes some kind of sense. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I, I think it was fascinating. I, I could have continued to listen. So, um, but there are already questions in the chat. So, just a reminder for folks on, uh, on the live stream that you can use the chat box to post your question or comment. Um, so, I think we can alternate between questions from the room and questions uh, from the chat. Um, I can, I can start with uh, the first question on the chat from Liz. Um, Liz says, you mentioned the trajectory from unknown director to mid and popular or well-known director, etc. when talking about the embargo project, so tra trajectory for those directors. Do you see any trends in the relationship to genre in this trajectory? And um, so, really, do these directors seem to do something different with Jar as they gain more critical or popular success? That's a really interesting question. I mean, I think if you look at if you look at Elamaya Tail Feathers, because we got the most look at her, I would say, in the clips. You get to I put the fourth one to line up with the body remembers when the world broke open, which is 
is her best known work, but it was also a feature film debut. So as far as film culture today goes, unfortunately, you're more likely to get attention for a feature anyway, because short films aren't necessarily like this booming business. They usually are calling card films. Certain films like Filander and Miscellaneous by Jeff Barnaby was unexpectedly seen by many, many people, but most short films are not uh, as well seen. Like Taika Waititi is one of the best known indigenous celebrity filmmakers. His, his breakout short film was Two Cars in One Night, which he then basically made a feature film take on and expanded it, and that's boy. So it's like, and so no, most people haven't actually seen Two Cars One Night, they've seen Boy. So I think it makes sense that she moved from a short film to a feature, but what's interesting probably is to note that this breakthrough feature, Body Remembers When the World Breaks Broke Open, is social realist, I call it. Um, not the only one, you know, it's, it's, it's shot mainly as a long take. It has invisible cuts from the time the two main characters meet. The two main characters were in Night Raiders together, by the way, uh, main actors. Um, and there's a, and it won big awards, like in prizes, and it's kind of like um, influential on that level. Screens at competitive film festivals wins $100,000 or whatever. But um, to me, that's indicative of a, the history in film criticism that's still kind of dominated by art cinema, European art cinema values. And that's where a social realist film would probably be taken more seriously than Night Raiders, which is dystopian sci-fi. Regardless of whether the stories they're trying to tell and the engagement they're having with the social and political realities, it's just as serious, in fact. But you're more likely to be taken seriously if you do a really well-received social realist film, especially women filmmakers emerging. So think of like Andrea Arnold with a fish tank, or Morgan Collar, uh, you know, that, <laughs> I can't remember, you talked about earlier. Lynn So. Uh, and, you know, that goes for men, too. It's like coming of age. Uh, no, they have a lot of coming of age comedies, in fact, <laughs> that they get breakthrough for. So you're, you're more likely to get attention this way. But from Body Members in the World Broke Open, she's, she's done some television directing, like I said, with Little Bird, Little Bird's high production Canadian miniseries, collaborative indigenous women, authors, um, Still in the kind of realism register, but you can see her history with genre, I think, when you look at the way she um, that, that first episode unfurls. Now, if you go to um, these, the other directors are totally different. So what I'm thinking is, it seems to me that Dennis Goulet, as she's gotten uh, more opportunities, she's just honed in on the skills she's uh, nurtured in the space of genre filmmaking. So I think you can see that from Wakening, and you see it in um, Night Raiders, and then you can see it in the episodes that she, uh, the Dear Lady episode in Reservation Dogs. There's a through line there, where there's horror elements, um, dystopian elements, strong genre marks. I don't know what she's going to do next, but um, sh her trajectory is different, and Lisa Jackson's is totally different. She has these, she has the most diverse career, and the most, the career that's most often crossing into other related media. Um, so the 3D documentary, the VR Highway of Tears, the VR immersive experience, and it's often shown in art in gallery context. So she's not well known on that same level, and yet her short film screened like crazy, like everywhere. Like Savage screened pretty much everywhere. So it's not like she hasn't been seen. But she has these early works that were very genre and hybrid. She seems to have moved into a different place. Um, she had something called Transmissions, which was a Vancouver-mounted, huge immersive experience. There was a whole academic symposium about it, but I haven't been able to see it. Her work is also less accessible, because it's probably in that multimedia, emerging media, arts uh, gallery space. Um, so the trajectories of the three don't seem entirely, uh, they don't seem the same. And yet they seem to illustrate that that feminist, indigenous, collaborative anthology rules-based model works really well to just increase the opportunities uh, to 
you know, feeding into each other's strengths. And you can see that by the fact that they all work kind of together. Um, and you see that in Reservation Dogs, because all the women who write and direct episodes are also well known for their own work outside of. For instance, the, the woman who directed the most episodes of Reservation Dogs is called uh, Tasbe Rose Chavez, I think that's her name. She's a Native American woman, and she just won the Sundance uh, Emerging Filmmaker Fellowship. So she then gets opportunity to make her own her own work um, separate from the Res Dogs Collective. So that's a similar thing. So that's more less indigenous feminists, I guess, but more like indigenous filmmakers helping to create opportunities. They can move into new mediums. They can move into new genres. They can tell stories in a different way. They have that freedom now because there's enough of them having successes. And like Taika Waititi being the producer on Night Raiders is an example of that kind of like, um, indigenous collaborative gesture. I don't know if that answered the question. Uh, yes, uh, I, I actually got a, a response saying, so interesting, thank you. I know, well, it was a great question because I don't really think about it too much. I did notice that they all have different strengths and their careers are going in different directions, but their careers also intersect at points. Mm -hmm. It's like some weird, big, global tapestry. I, I have uh, other questions on the chat, but if there's a question from the room, yes. Oh. You talked about this at the beginning, and we also were talking a bit in the car on the way here, more to do with indigenous knowledge in the broader sense, vis-a-vis -vis critical posthumanism, because they're not the same thing, but they overlap to a certain degree, obviously. Uh, but here it's more about indigenous feminisms, and you, you made that point about how at a certain point indigenous feminisms part company or don't want to necessarily line up with critical posthumanism, and I just wondering if you want to say more about that, because I thought that was really interesting. And because the idea of radical relationality, I would think, really connects everything, you know, uh, in a good way. Yeah, that, that one, yeah. which I think, but that's the thing about a critical posthumanism today. I think we can see a, we see a, a, a branch of critical posthumanism that aligns. And then you see these parts of critical posthumanism that are polar opposite, that are more like transhumanism, and they're not really relevant. But in the part that's on this side, let's say, that's really attentive to not just to like Western humanistic ideologies perpetuated in the present that continue to cause problems in the way humans envision themselves and relate. That's important. But there's all these other aspects of it, like you're interested in animal studies, some people are interested in disability studies, people are interested in um, the, anthropo the Anthropocene kind of ideas all intersect with critical posthumanism. These areas, like Rosie Bradilti is probably the best known for, but like I said, late Paraguay, and not by the name of critical posthumanism is relevant. Um, these seem to be, that seems to be the space where um, critical posthumanism and um, Indigenous feminism, but also like just this kind of indigenous filmmaking seems to be like even Jeff Barnaby's films and stuff would be relevant. Like they line up quite well. But where I think that they depart is uh, we talked about this in the car. Like I think Rosie Bardotti has tried uh, most explicitly to address some of the racial blind spots because she's been the one who and she lines up well with Giorgio Gaman for me in that she's saying. We were saying humanistic ideas have these problems, but we need to be explicit that not everyone has ever, ever been taken into the category of the human. So to to really, and that what I, that's what I mean by critical posthumanism. That's like critical of itself is to like really try to keep in mind those historical exclusions that are continuing in the present. They, that they always existed. There was never a place where there was some kind of humanistic utopia. And there's always those humanistic ideas only protected a minority of people and in a minority of conditions. I mean, that's what the disability studies scholars are trying to tell us as well. Like, certain people could be protected at certain moments. Um, you know, your national identity impacts on these things, your sexual orientation or what it's supposed to be. So in that space, when critical posthumanists try to take uh, put a lot of effort into acknowledging and to highlighting that those historical exclusions were always present in Western humanism and humanistic thinking. Um, it's not just about, like, let's undermine human kind of uh, superiority from other life forms. The thing is that I think they have trouble, trouble doing is, like, 
That's a big thing to say, and we can all think of that really abstractly. You say, oh yeah, I get what you mean there. People, they were women maybe, and they never really had access to land, they didn't vote, they, they were slaves. Like, we can think about these historical, but where indigenous kind of studies is at is to really highlight the particularities of that. Like, you see how these works circle back to the same issues related to land sovereignty, related to language, um, you know, erasure and revitalization related to the um, the efforts to kind of extract people from their cultures, re-educate them, and that was to diminish the that was to get you know to not have to honor the treaty agreements, and at least in the United States context, it was to kind of eradicate the sense of a difference to try to assimilate, so that there didn't have to be any kind of like obligation in the present. So they, they, they're circling back to those same things. What I think is interesting for the, in the case of the indigenous women filmmakers is that all of those issues take a certain, they look different when you're framing it around indigenous women and not necessarily just as a like, uh, indigenous men or gender doesn't matter. And they're often going back to those issues of women's bodies um, and the way they have been specifically the site of colonial exploitation, so. I don't know. I don't know if I answered the question. Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay. Thanks. Um, I have two more questions uh, in the chat uh, right now. So one is from Adrian. Um, Thanks for your presentation. I am wondering how you think about this place, uh, how you think about or displace the history of misinterpretations of indigenous stories by non-indigenous scholars in relation to your work and perhaps in relation to Zoe Todd's critique of new materialism. What's kind of examples there? Like what kind of misinterpretations are they thinking of? Like specific? Um, there is no specific example um, given, yes. Mm -hmm. And there's a bit of a lag between the room and the, so the person is just getting your question right now. <laughs> so read that first part of the question again. Um, I'm wondering how you think about um, or displace the history of misinterpretations of indigenous stories by non-indigenous scholars in relation to your work. Hmm. And perhaps in relation to Zoe Todd's critique of new materialism. I'm not sure because I, I've i mainly been doing work on cinema, like film and related media stories by indigenous Directors. So anthropological and literature mis misinterpretations, for example. So uh, thinking about like films, like uh, thinking about films like uh, Nanako's North kind of stuff, or like Dances with Wolves kind of stuff. Possibly. Okay. Um, or Pocahontas, for that matter. Um, Well, I, I think I kind of got into this obliquely because I think the fact is if you think about something like Reservation Dogs and the Framing Device, I don't know if you guys have seen it. So in the Framing Device, the main character Bear, he imagines this like uh, native warrior character who's like dressed in like he showed up from the Western, like in the stereotypes. But it's, it's taking that stereotype from the white colonial American imaginary drawing attention to it, and then poking fun at it, and yet, the character also does function as a sort of like self-reflective mechanism for the main character, and a mentor almost. So it's, it takes the satire, and then takes it over. It's a little bit like what I said that Dennis Goulet did with the Pocahontas thing with the birds and then the drones. It's like, I think they're, they're drawing attention for indigenous viewers. They're poking fun at the way their stories have been, and, they're, and, the, and their historic, their ancestors. I mean, Pocahontas was a real person. The way that they've been misrepresented and the way they've been strategically utilized to support a, a colonial, um, you know, colonial-oriented authorship. You know, the, the Rape Revenge film had that line in it, you know. I don't care what they say in Pocahontas, she was 12 and she was 9, 10, I can't remember. She got John Smith. So they draw attention to that, but then they immediately, uh, they can poke fun at it, or they can just satirize it to emphasize how ridiculous it is, but then they also use, use it. So it's not just a simple 
two-dimensional thing. It kind of goes into a more complex place. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that probably the best scholarship that I've read on the way that the uh, Native American stories have been kind of like bastardized by American cinema, but the way that there's like a new renaissance of indigenous filmmakers in North America, in the U.S. and Canada that are taking, that's The Savage Screen by Kelly Simmons. And that was a dissertation uh, she wrote under the guidance of Michelle Rahija, the one who wrote uh, Reservation Realism. That's a pretty good and interesting take. So it goes through, it walks through the way that Native American stories and characters have been purposed in white authored texts, in Westerns and horror, all the way from the start of cinema, and then gets to stuff like Blood Quantum and Rhymes for Young Ghouls. It gets to that in the end as like, this is, this is them taking that. So that's story sovereignty, really. Um, so I think, I don't know how I would relate that to critiques of new materialism, because I'm not familiar with it. But I, I, I will try to think about that more. Um, I mean, I think some of the new materialists like have been most relevant to uh, some of the ideas that they brought into critical posthumanism have lined up the, be the best with indigenous futures idea with the radical relationality. Um, but I haven't read too much critique of it. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, and this is from a person who's not a film studies person at all. But um, from your presentation um, and the various examples you've given us, I, I think there's, uh, and I, I want to see if I'm on the right track here. There, there's something interesting about, yes, the radical relationality, like I, I, I completely see that emerging in the various examples, but also an idea of methodological, a methodological approach to making film um, that is uh, feminist, yes. Um, it, it's a challenge to the, the, the traditional conventional way of, of making film and telling stories with film. Um, but it's also very much in line with um, the critical posthumanist use of assemblage, of, of the notion of assemblage. Of, like, and, and you gave us examples of, of, of films that, that make use of um, different genres within the one film and different <laughs> kind of visuals like animation yeah. and 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 so it, is this something um like is this all part of the feminist slash posthumanist indigenous disruption of a conventional way of seeing the world and telling stories and is that method required to tell those new stories and look at different kinds of futures um, I'm not sure if the method, I don't think the method would be required, but I think it is a, a recognizable pattern that connects some of the works. So I'll, I'll bring up something that's slightly tangential that I think is relevant. Because that was, when you say methodology, I'm, I was thinking more of like the ethos in the film production environment. That's what first came to my mind, which is different than like the way the film appears and the, and the kinds of animation mixed with. Uh, voiceover and archival footage and such, which is what Vitos was and what, what Sucrefish is. So those are similar to each other um, in their collage kind of form. Uh, in that, you can go online and find a really interesting talk, and it was during the height of the pandemic, it was before Night Rider Raiders came out, and it was where the, um, the Maori women who worked on the film were zooming in with Dennis Goulet, and the producer of Night Raiders and Dan Scully's father, who I guess was like an MP or something. He's Keith Gruber, I don't know the politics very well. But so they were all talking about the process of making Night Raiders. And in the course of that conversation, the two parties were emphasizing that for indigenous filmmakers, it's often way easier for them to quickly fall in to collaborate with indigenous people, even if they're from across the globe, than it is for them to work in the production environments of their own colonial industry. So they say there's like a shorthand, there's a, they, they have, the cultural practices they would want to bring into the production environment are more naturally kindred. So this is what they were talking about, this idea that part of the radical um, alternative gesture of the indigenous film, the, the kind of global indigenous film movement that's uh, taking um, flight at the moment is to actually uh, you know, reframe all those ideas about what filmmaking is. Like, for instance, you know, the male auteur director vision that's still very dominant, um, the hierarchical set, the way the production works. And we have a lot of these collaborative features 
utilizing more horizontal power structures. Um, there's a lot of mentorship happening, and that talk, that talk is on Zoom or something. It's like an hour and a half. It was very interesting. They talked about all the stuff they were doing on set, and they're they're integrating like Maori and Cree uh, processes for just doing things right and well according to their cultures, implementing them from the first day of the set to kind of help to take care of each other. Filmmaking is intense, it's high pressure. We have all these problems about abuses that we hear about all the time. You need the sexual intimacy of your neighbors now, you need you know, health and safety everywhere. And that's because we know there's abuses in that hierarchical structure. Those will line up with the abuses of colonial, uh, historic, systemic uh, violence. So they're trying to do it from that way. And I'm not sure entirely if I can associate it with the experimentation, but if you look at the fact that these were rules driven and that they were giving each other these challenges. So in the first case, in the case of Savage in the first environment, she was given this challenge to like mix heavy metal and I don't I can't remember exactly what her challenge was, but it was it was to take her out of her comfort zone. And it led her to do something that was kind of uh, an unusual hybrid. And it's the same thing happened to Beatos, and that was directly related to Savage, because she was told she had to create a film in this, not Savage, Suckerfish, sorry. And then they have those mixed media elements, they have those, uh, they're engaging with their own family history, so they have to use a kind of like, they have to use animation or reenactment or voiceover in some way. You're more likely to get viewers interested when you utilize these kind of strategies when you're dealing with autobiography as well. Than talking head kind of interview. I mean, right. so they're probably influencing each other, and maybe that collaborative uh, practice in the anthologies is particularly well suited to that. I don't. I don't know if that means you have to. I just think maybe it's effective at certain stages of the career. Mm -hmm. You can see as they're moving into high budget television, like prestige works, which is what they've moved into. The two, because Ella my example is even in this big Canadian series. Uh, like about cops and based on a famous crime novel. I, don't, I can't remember what Kiefer Sullivan's brother's in it. I'm not Canadian, so I don't know the name of the case. Alfred Molina's in it, maybe? But anyway, she was a lead in that high budget television production, too, which was like an Apple distributed thing, which dealt with the, it actually dealt with the residential school drama in totally crime genre. Mm -hmm. And they brought in Tracy Deer, the Mohawk director of. Um, what was that film? That was a big TIFF winner a couple years ago. The one that dealt with the Mohawk uh, resistance when the Club of Rock police kind of had the standoff. Does anybody remember that film, Scott? Anyway, she came in and they brought her, a indigenous woman filmmaker, they brought her in just to direct that episode. So they've moved into this, you know, you know what prestige television is. It's high budget, it's glossy, it's got some one or two famous people. Um, so they, they're not going to have the level of experimentation that they had in Vitos, you know? But you can see that some, like I tried to show with Little Bird, but I didn't even get to show you the clip. You can see that evidence of that experimentation there. And if you watch the Dear Lady episode of Reservation Dogs, and I encourage you to watch the whole thing of Reservation Dogs, but you can see, you'll see connections to like awakening in there. Uh, great, I have one last question here, if, if we may. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's another question by Liz. Uh, can you expand more about indigenous artists moving toward newer media like VR? Is this about projecting media that seemingly have too strongly entrenched formula? Is it about embracing media where the rules may yet be written? I think so, and that's how I think of Lisa Jackson. Really, I'm not sure what she's working on right now. I, I, but if you look at if you look at her like. Um, page on a Canadian on screen that has all the works. You can see how diverse they are. And they're really like theoretically sophisticated as they go on, especially something like transmissions. Um, but the thing about moving into that, that's like, to me, that kind of stuff that shows in galleries and has to be installed and, and requires like devices and big screens and headsets. To me, that always like narrows down the potential publics. Like for instance, I haven't been able to see it. Like I saw Bidab in First Light because they screened it at Maui Land, which is an hour from where I live in Aotearoa, and it was amazing. But I don't think I would ever have seen that. And it was just like accidental. And that big budget um, 360 degree VR film that I saw about uh, Aboriginal in Western Australia, uh, it was about uh, an Aboriginal boy out in Western Australia who witnessed 
um, the British atomic testing as a kid, and he didn't know what it was because he had no uh, experience with uh, modern technology or culture. So he thought it was like a supernatural, like a spirit. So he's an old man now, and he utilized that technology and, and collaborated with the uh, filmmaker to show that using that new media. And I saw that by accident too. It was like they brought it at great expense to Papa, which is the National Museum there in, in, in Wellington. These things are incredibly impactful. Like I, both of those experiences really influenced me, and I wrote about them in the chapter that I did in Screening the Post-Human on, on um, apocalypse, and critical post-human apocalypse. But I, it's so inaccessible. But they go interesting places. Like that collisions one, they they screen it for an anti-nuclear discussion in a UN meeting. Like so, they they do interesting things. But I just wonder if you can't see them. But that's different than Highway of Tears, because you can actually, you can at least look, you know they try to do VR things where you can at least use your fingers to look around. So you don't get the full effect, but you get something of it. And that was funded by uh, one of your national broadcasters. CBC logo. Right? Yeah. So that, so her stuff is kind of, go, runs the gamut from something that's like, oh, that's accessible. And then you could see Savage, just she posted on Vimeo, stuff that's radically inaccessible. Like, I can't find out how to watch this. I know it's screened at Sundance, but it, so yeah, you can do these things that you can't do with traditional cinema because the, the experiences that they enable are so special, but then they're limited. And this has happened with really well-known filmmakers as well. Like I think Inaritu did that film called Carne and Iosada, like the one that's supposed to give you the feeling of crossing the border from Mexico into the U.S. But I have been trying to experience that for years. And it just goes from one gigantic museum six months later to another that's like across the globe for me. Like, am I ever going to see it? Probably not. You know, these are that's the limitation, I guess, of these things. Or like Stephen Queen, the British director, he does some interesting museum kind of art gallery stuff, but it's hard to see it. I'm not saying that doesn't mean you should do it. It must be really awesome when she gets this big commission like transmissions. And then she can make this experience, and then the small public will see it, and the, their worldview will change. I just like I think the difference is with the short film is it does travel. Just most people don't watch short films. That's the other problem. People watch feature films, and especially if they if Netflix picks them up for because uh, <laughs> Body Remembers When the World Broke Open was on Netflix for a couple of years. Because uh, Amy DuVernay's Array Now or whatever her production company picked it up for distribution went to Netflix. The big bunch of television shows travel well. Look at reservations all the time. People understand genre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, genre and high budget television and feature films picked up by Apple or Netflix or these are the ones that people can see. Mm. Great. Well, thank you. And also thanks from the chat uh, for this great talk. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I shoved a lot of information out there and it might have been dizzying, but thanks for the patience and the attention. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.